What's up, everyone? And welcome to another episode of the Renewable Energy Smart Pod. I'm your host, Sean McMahon. And quite often on this show, we do a deep dive on the people and technologies that are powering the renewable energy sector. But for today's episode, we're going to step back a bit and take a wider look at the news and trends that are shaping the global energy transition. Let's face it, a lot has happened in the last year or so, including Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act right here in the U.S. So Luke Brett from Reuters is going to join me later to talk about how those events and more have recalibrated the energy landscape. Luke's role at Reuters puts him in the room with key industry executives and leading policymakers. So the insights he's gleaned are worth a listen. And if you want to get in the same room with all those influential experts, Luke is also going to share the details of upcoming events that he and the team at Reuters are planning for the rest of 2023. Here at Smart Brief, we've got some huge news on the podcast front. We've launched yet another show, and this one focuses on all things sustainability. The Sustainability Smart Pod will keep you informed about all the people, technologies, and trends who are shaping a more sustainable society for all of us. I will be joined by other Smart Brief content experts, including Karen Cantor, Evan Milberg, and Jan van Valkenburg, as we discuss the ways sustainability is influencing how businesses operate. This show takes a bit of a different approach for us because it's industry agnostic. So while the show you're listening to now focuses on the energy industry, the Sustainability Smart Pod will look at all industries. There's a lot of knowledge that can be shared, so we're hoping to highlight companies that aren't just talking the talk when it comes to sustainability, but walking the walk. I think you'll find the Sustainability Smart Pod to be a great listen. So look for it on all the major podcast platforms or click on the link in the show notes for this episode. And now, let's get to my conversation with Luke Brett from Reuters. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me. My guest today is Luke Brett, who's the Global Project Director for the Energy Transition at Reuters. Luke, how are you doing today? Hi, Sean. Nice to be with you. Thanks for having me. I'm doing well, thanks. Yeah, I'm excited to talk to you because as someone in your role, I think you uh, quite literally sometimes have a front row seat to some of the most high-level conversations dealing with the energy transition. So tell me a little bit more about your role at Reuters and what your team does. Yeah, absolutely. Very much so. No, that's super apt. We, we do indeed get a front row seat to some of the most uh, fascinating and interesting conversations in this space. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a producer in the energy transition team at Reuters events. And obviously, Thomson Reuters, for those of, of the listeners who don't know, is one of the largest kind of news agencies and media organizations in the world. What we do and, and what my role broadly boils down to is sort of serving various different executive communities around the world with business critical information. And, and the primary form that that information comes in is, is in our events and the summits that we do. But we also produce a lot of statistical reviews, reports, surveys, and other kind of contents like white papers that really drill into some of the trends and, and the, the market analysis that those executives really need. So yeah, looking forward to discussion today. And, and I'm going to be using quite a lot of the uh, content that we've produced over the last couple of years as some of the backbone for the conversation we're having today as well. Great. Well, let's just dive right into it. So what are some of the biggest trends you're seeing right now when it comes to the energy transition? Yeah, I think, I mean, the energy transition is such a dynamic space and such a dynamic market space at the moment. But I think there are a few kind of key trends that we've seen really emerge to the top of the pile in the last 12, 24 months. And the first one is governance, really, and sort of the role of the policymaker in the energy transition. You know, we've seen climate action and we've seen climate change action, you know, being quite top of the pile for a lot of Western economies, Western national governments over the last couple, you know, few de years, decades even. But what we're seeing now is more of a trend towards those national policy frameworks really aligning with the energy transition and backing kind of clean energy production uh, wholeheartedly. So there's two examples here that I want to bring up. Obviously, the first one comes as no surprise to you. I'm sure the Inflation Reduction Act signed last year by President Biden I mean, alongside all of the other kind of tax relief credits and, and investment incentives within the IRA, $270 billion of investment in tax credits goes to renewable energy um, and clean energy domestic power generation there. So, you know, renewable power generation, nuclear, hydrogen, electric vehicles, all of these really critical elements of the, of the transition are receiving these tax credits. And so, you know, I think it was uh, Princeton University came out with a report recently suggesting that those efforts and that in, those tax credits and that investment incentive could cut carbon emissions massively by, by 2030. 
Similarly, the IRA also now has elements of the Justice 40 initiative, one of President Biden's projects, which looks at you know, 40% of the overall benefits of this, these climate and clean energy and related investments um, should be going to marginalized or you know, over-polluted communities or, or those who are perhaps underserved by energy infrastructure today. So I think the IRA is a really, really interesting example of how you know, the federal government in the US is now kind of throwing its full investment power behind clean energy and domestic clean energy power generation. Um, and a really good indicator of the role that kind of how the cha- the role of governance is sort of changing in the energy transition discourse. And so that's kind of on your side of the pond, Sean. But then when we look over uh, over here in, in sort of Europe, I also wanted to touch on Repower EU, which is the, this new EU plan ostensibly to, to sort of divorce the EU from uh, Russian fossil fuel supplies and supply chains. But you know, actually, it, it really does also tend to focus on, on clean energy production and, and also critically energy efficiency. And I think this is a, a really interesting indicator of the role that geopolitics is also now playing within energy transition and, and that marketplace. You know, geopolitics now has really, really strong implications on the energy transition, given those energy security concerns that are now becoming so important. So, as I say, this is all this our Repower EU is all about, you know, clean energy production and accelerating that in, in European countries. But it, it's a quite a specific example in terms of divorcing the Europe from, from Russian oil and gas supplies. But it is indicative of the way that legacy energy relationships are changing and the role that geopolitics has such a strong impact on those energy supply chains. The energy transition is now actually offering energy security guarantees that it couldn't have done previously. So very, very interesting to see how that the role of the policymaker in the EU there is changing as well. Again, I mentioned all the content we do, and I wanted to bring in some specific stats here. So we did a trends report with Deloitte back in uh, last year, towards the beginning of last year, where we polled uh, a whole host of industry professionals on various different elements of the energy transition. And one of those that we focused on was kind of public policy and the role of the policymaker. 90% or more of the respondents that took that survey agreed that the public sector leadership is super critical to the energy transition success. And similarly, over 60% felt that COP26, the UN's annual climate meeting, those outcomes from COP26 would impact their business strategy in the next five years, over 60%. And so I think what that really demonstrates is that corporates and, and sort of corporate business players are now really paying close attention to the to the public sector and, and looking to work hand in glove um, with policymakers on accelerating the transition. So there's that policymaking piece, which I think is one of the most important trends. And, you know, there's another one I think is super important as well is the the kind of the advent of digitalization within the energy transition. I was having a conversation with somebody about this earlier today. The interconnectivity and the the wide range of kind of Internet of Things, the huge amount of digital software that we have on offer now in terms of increasing efficiency will impact the way that the energy transition is accelerated and is now actually you know quite business critical for, for a lot of um, particularly these larger organizations who have you know huge legacy operations that need decarbonization or that need to be made more efficient digital is kind of intrinsic in, in doing that and similarly as well you know the more that we look at energy production becoming decentralized and you know becoming more localized as well you know the idea of uh, local power generation through our onshore wind or or solar uh, energy for example despite the fact that it's decentralized everything is still connected right and so there is that need for digital software to ensure that that is all aligned, ensure that all of these systems are playing nicely together and working well together. So this idea of digitalization is something that I think is going to be 100% key to to the success of, of the energy transition. Let me just jump in there. So in, in getting back to the, the survey you did with Deloitte coming out at the COP26, right? I think everyone agrees there was a ton of momentum coming out of Glasgow. Uh, I'm curious, is that a, a survey you'll do annually? So there might be another one coming up this year? Because it seems to me that like, not as much buzz and momentum coming out of COP27 as there was COP26. Yeah, yeah. So we we do produce annual trend reports, um, and it is something that we're looking at doing again this year. And they typically come off the back of the events that we do and the discussions that we have there. But we we also do them in combination with these surveys that we release. Yeah, really interesting point about COP27 as well. Um, I think there was a, an element of COVID and, and the COVID pandemic in, in last year and the years before that kind of crystallized the importance of COP26. I don't know if you remember, but there was a lot of conversation, particularly here in the UK where I'm based around you know the pandemic and lockdowns and people staying inside and, and the obvious impact that it had on the environment and, and people's working and living environments. And so 
I think you know COP26 was almost a you know a unique flash in the pan in terms of the attention that it got from from the public sector and from the public at large. I'd agree. I, I haven't seen quite as much kind of uh, fervorance for COP27. But that said, you know those meetings are a really really good example. I think of the role that large scale meetings and and really large scale events can actually play in accelerating change. It really goes to the heart of what we're trying to achieve as well. You know, we want to bring all of these stakeholders together. The idea being that having all of these folks in one room is the best way to hammer out, you know, collaborative partnerships and um, what the future of energy will look like. And so, you know, I think even even though it may not be front of center in the minds of the public um, at large, I think COP27 and, and the COP meetings annually play such an important role in the energy transition. And um, yeah, I think they're super valuable for, for all of those players who get involved in them. So I guess it'll be interesting to see how much hype builds up around this year's COP28 meeting in the UAE. Back to you. You said you had a third point you want to make? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the third point is one that is, again, quite obvious to, to any of those who work in the industry, and it is renewable investment patterns, essentially. Uh, I think it's it's not really a surprise, again, to those who are insiders. But I think when you – I was really struck. I was just looking at a graph that I saw earlier today. I think it was in, in uh, Bloomberg. Uh, looking at the cost of renewable technology over the last decade of 15 years, such a massive sharp fall across all elements of renewable technology from wind, solar, storage. Storage in particular has had a huge, huge fall up until last year. And, and this year, you know, we've seen a slight uptick given the massive rise in energy prices, again, linked back to the geopolitics and, and the invasion of Ukraine. But um, what we have seen is that, you know, two, I, I think it was an IRENA report that I was reading that said, Two thirds of renewable power added in 2021 had lower costs than the cheapest cold fire options in G20 countries as well. So what we are seeing is a really encouraging fall in the cost of renewable technology that hopefully means in combination with those policy making pieces I outlined earlier, uh, we should see a massive, massive uptick now in investment and deployment of those renewable assets. Okay. And you mentioned the cost of renewables kind of coming down and the latest data on that. So which sectors or which technologies, I should say, you know, wind, solar, green hydrogen, things like that. Which ones are enjoying the most momentum right now? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I think it's. I think they're all enjoying momentum in their own way. Really, I think it's becoming clearer and clearer that each of those that you touched on there has their own role to play. But I think there are a few that are seeing a lot more attention in in the last kind of twelve months that I think are really interesting. The first is nuclear energy. Now, it's it's you know somewhat of a debate, particularly over on my side of the pond, as to where nuclear energy falls in the renewable, green, not green spectrum. In my personal opinion, I look at nuclear energy as a really interesting kind of baseload solution and baseload augmentation of renewable uh, energy. And particularly, I'm most interested in, in this idea of small modular reactors, right? And um, their role to play in in a sort of uh, localized power generation, particularly in developing economies and particularly uh, in remote communities as well. In nuclear as well, we've also seen this big fusion breakthrough that happened in the last couple of months. I believe it was just at the end of last year. Um, fusing energy over in, in the US and finally seeing, looking as though it's going to be market viable at some point in the next century or so. So again, you know, nuclear is, has somewhat of a controversial reputation in some circles, but personally, I, I see it as something that I think really should be involved in this conversation around the energy transition more. Um, and I think the technology behind those SMRs and behind the fusion energy breakthrough is super fascinating. And so I'm really keen to see whether SMRs actually hit market commercialization by 2030. I think that's that's the risk that's been identified in this space. You know, will will they have market viability in the next decade, 20 years to justify that high cost of investment that they have today? But still to be seen as to as to how that plays out. Yeah, I think what they need is a little bit more publicity, quite frankly. I think, you know, the public doesn't isn't quite aware of, of SMRs and what they do and how they're structured and things like that. I mean, I live a mile from the headquarters for New Scale, right? One of the biggest players in that space. And my neighbors, I've never heard of them. <laughs> really? Like, That's really they're, interesting. They're, their headquarters is right down the road. And people are like, wait, who are they? What do they do? And so I, I think it's almost one of a just public awareness and public education on that might help. Most definitely. Yeah. I mean, the nuclear energy industry really has has had a branding problem for, for you know, a couple of decades. I don't think that's a really controversial thing to say. But at the same time, um, I think that is shifting now. And I think the the new kinds of technology that are coming to the forefront and, and what they offer. I mean, for SMRs in particular, like I, I look at it through through the lens of those developing economies or those, you know, remote communities. If SMR market production is is able to to spin up effectively in the US, there's absolutely no reason why those SMRs couldn't be exported 
you know, sold on to developing economies. And then again, we're offering them something that isn't that that kind of low cost fossil fuel pay as you go pay to play kind of um, energy production that they currently rely on, because they don't have the, the kind of level of investment and capital to spring for renewable infrastructure at this stage. So I think SMRs is super interesting, definitely one of the pieces of technology to keep an eye on um, at the moment. Um, there's another couple as well. I think, you know, floating solar is something that we have heard a lot about in, in recent months as well. This idea of kind of massive floating offshore solar farms. Um, again, I think, you know, and this also comes into the conversation about offshore wind. I think we're now seeing this sort of shift from um, offshore activities primarily focusing on kind of oil and gas exploration and production and more looking to making use of that ocean environment space for for renewable power production. And of course, within solar as well, and also within wind energy, there have been super interesting developments in terms of the quality and the innovation behind these different pieces of technology, you know, new photovoltaic materials on solar panels. You know, I saw, I think it was Siemens who were doing a uh, working in conjunction with a university, I believe it was MIT on a new design for wind turbine fan blades, right? That were in, you know, just a simple design change really doesn't make much difference to construction and manufacturing, but it cut a massive amount of um, inefficiency off the top and, and made them much more uh, maybe able to produce much more electricity uh, on a single turbine. So I think what we're seeing is a lot of development and a lot of R&D going into these specific kinds of technologies and just really tightening the bolts and making them a bit sharper. One more as well to mention, which I feel is super important and that we constantly hear about is, is energy storage. You know, China has had, yes, I think it's got something like 30 gigawatts of, of non-hydro uh, storage capacity planned for the, for the next three, four years. And, and this idea of energy storage becoming more efficient and more effective is really, really intrinsic, again, to the, to the success of a renewable integration. We've got to be able to store that renewable energy and make use of it again effectively in order for these renewable assets to be as effective as they can be. So yeah, I'm personally really interested to see how the energy storage conversation evolves further um, and what the technology looks like in that space in the next decade. Are you seeing any headwinds for any of those individual technologies or for the sector as a whole? Yeah, I mean, there are still a significant amount of barriers when it comes to the energy transition, I think. And and I would say that, you know, that each of those technologies has their own specific barriers. And I think we touched on them a little bit around nuclear, right? Market viability, branding, you know, however you want to phrase that. And I think if you look at wind and solar, you've always got the traditional NIMBY problems, not in my backyard, right? And but so I think rather than looking at specific technolo technological barriers, I think there are still actually some more existential barriers that we're seeing in the energy transition space at the moment, which primarily honestly boil down to costs, right? You know, the cost of retrofitting, of repurposing, of redesigning infrastructure, it's extremely expensive and it's cost prohibitive for, for a lot of, um, not even just a lot of companies or a lot of businesses, but for a lot of countries and a lot of you know, national market environments. Um, so, I mean, if we take the example of digital, right, one something that we talked about at the very top, the role of digital solutions and digitalization, you know, they can help maximize efficiency. They can be used for analysis, risk analysis. You know, they can be used for workforce management. Um, they can do almost everything that, that needs to be done within kind of a, a resource management and an efficiency management perspective. But, of course, the level of investment is massive in order to get that digital integration uh, done effectively across an entire organization. So for smaller players, you know, it's while it may be obvious that digital is super important, they may just not have the capital or the capital, um, the free capital to go and invest in that. Similarly, then, you know, the high cost of um, the high capital cost of infrastructure development in itself for, for energy means that affordable financing is going to be really important. And, you know, we, again, touching on the developing economies piece and what I mentioned earlier, um, I was reading a really interesting article by the World Bank. There was a quote in there that, that was touching on this idea of, you know, developing economies at the moment are very much reliant on fossil fuel power generation, typically from a third party, again, also hang, uh, hearkening back to this conversation about Russia and, and European supply chains. For lots of developing economies, they're dependent on fossil fuel power being fed into them. You know, they get it at a cheaper rate than they possibly could for renewables. And it's, again, cost prohibitive for them to, to step ahead and, and invest in that renewable infrastructure because they don't have that free capital to do so. But in this World Bank piece, there was a quote which really stuck with me, which was, quote, the poverty trap becomes an energy trap that is becoming a climate trap. And so by this, what we're seeing is that by virtue of the fact that they, you know, these developing economies don't have the capital to reach out and start that renewable infrastructure development, they get become caught in the fossil fuel supply chain, 
caught in having to continually feed their their grids and their businesses and their homes through fossil fuel energy because of it's cheaper. But that then, of course, is then trapping us and their economies in the trap of heavy carbon emissions. And so we need affordable financing in the energy transition space to do so. And whether that comes through, you know, um, multinational development banks, whether it comes through donors or investment, private investment, institutional investment, wherever it may come from, mobilizing that low cost capital for developing economies is going to be super critical. I mean, another big barrier I think that we see a lot here is is around infrastructure in itself and the nature of that infrastructure. A good example, I would say, on this would be electric vehicles, right? And electric vehicles have had a real renaissance moment in in the last kind of decade, maybe even five years, really, where we see Teslas and we see all these large automotive automotive makers now leaning into electric vehicles, which is obviously fantastic. And from a consumer perspective, is excellent um, in terms of the cost of charging, et cetera. And, and that continues to fall as well. But you know, we have to ask ourselves these these difficult questions. I mean, um, I think it's California over on your side of the pond who's who's looking at banning the sale of petrol cars in the next twenty years and or petrol gas gas powered cars. And um, again, a laudable a laudable um, initiative, a laudable approach, and a great idea. But we have to look at the practicality of what that means. Where I live in London, here on my street, you know, there are two rows of houses, and the road in front of me is quite narrow, and there's just enough space for two single file lines of cars to park on either side of the road. And there's only space for one car to drive down the road in the middle. You know, and I often look outside when I'm here working at home and and ask myself, well, if we were to try and have robust electric vehicle infrastructure in London, what would that look like realistically? How would this be feasible? If every person who lived on my street drove an electric vehicle, the reality behind charging their cars would be absolutely impossible to recognize. You know, it's a bit of a facetious example, and again, realizing that it's not spot on, but I think that the notion of that argument is still pretty important. You know, do we have, can we have the acceleration in the infrastructure development that we need in order to serve what we think the community, the energy system and energy supply chains of tomorrow are going to look like? So this also comes into play with hydrogen as well, right? You know, hydrogen is great, can be shipped in a liquid form, um, can potentially be repurposed into uh, existing kind of natural gas infrastructure. But again, super cost prohibitive. And the idea of what the journey between where we are today and realizing that tomorrow looks like is only going to be achieved through massive, massive levels of investment and kind of facing into the wind, if you like. I mean, you said it yourself in terms of headwinds. I think that really is the way that we have to look at this. It's battling against that headwind is going to be an imperative if we want to be successful and actually deliver a kind of net zero energy. Yeah, I mean, a lot of folks I talk to think that one of the biggest things hydrogen has going for it is the fact that so much of the infrastructure is already in place, you know, with gas pipelines. I mean, it's, exactly. it's, it's almost some people think it's the biggest step that it has ahead of some of the other technologies. For sure. So we've talked a little bit about events like, you know, the COP26, 7, and then upcoming COP28. So obviously your team puts on a lot of events for Reuters where you bring in a lot of these, the leading minds from around the world together. So talk to me a little bit about some of the stuff you have on the schedule for, you know, the near future or say the rest of the year. So yeah, we've got a, a whole host of really exciting events um, coming up this year, and I'll talk about them each in turn. But before I do that, just some context around what we're trying to do. You know, we run fairly small, fairly intimate events, but we keep them focused on those who are essentially the most important decision makers in this energy transition space. So we work with you know CEOs and executives from the worlds of oil and gas, utilities, renewables, chemicals, hard to abate sectors, as well as finance and policymaking and manufacturing and EPC and digital and all of these other players who are involved in the conversation. We bring them together and we unite them in purpose and in outlook uh, and to sort of discuss how they can use their boardroom position to really accelerate the energy transition effectively. So like I said, we've got four events coming up this year, and I'm really excited about all of them. I think all of them are are looking to achieve slightly different things, but are all on really, really important topics. So the first we've got coming up is in New York City, and it's our global energy transition event, which is uh, on June 7th and 8th. This is the flagship event in the portfolio and looks at the sort of international macroeconomic and existential challenge that the energy transition presents. So here we focus on international collaboration, you know, forging innovative partnerships and cross-sectoral partnerships, working with policymakers, securing that investment flow and that capital, you know, being ready for a clean economy and preparing all of these different stakeholders for what the future of clean energy means and looks like. And also really, really uh, critically, the just transition and energy equity and energy accessibility. 
this is something that I think is super intrinsic to this conversation and something that should never be left out of the discussion. Not just how are we going to bring uh, low cost electricity to developed economies, but how are we going to bring the rest of the world and those developing economies up with us? And again, this harkens back to the cost conversation we had earlier. What we look to do in these events is, is really kind of provide those executives with sort of practical and tangible pathways to delivering both their own sustainability strategies in their companies and their organizations, but also to carve out what their wider role in society as a whole is. So that's the global event. That's in New York. And then that focuses on the international piece, as I said. And then when we look through to September, we've got our industry transition event in Pittsburgh. This focuses specifically on the hard to abase and kind of industrial decarbonization, industrial co-location, much more of a kind of an infrastructure uh, construction flavoring to that event. And again, focusing on another key vertical within the transition and, and one that we haven't touched on much in our conversation today, you know, industrial decarbonization specifically, the challenges that that has are unique and wide ranging, but we see that. Uh, industrial decarbonization and industrial transition conversation really fitting in within the wider discourse around energy supply chains, energy consumption, generation and, and distribution as well. And then when we look towards the end of the year, come November time, we'll have our two regional market summits, Energy Transition North America in Houston and Energy Transition Europe in London. Again, we retain that executive feel, we retain that seniority of our audience, but we're really looking here at the sort of regional challenges that we see in each of those market spaces. So, you know, this year, for example, or I should say last year in 2022, in North America, you know, we focused pretty heavily on the role of policy, uh, on the Inflation Reduction Act, and, and on its subsequent impacts on investment patterns and, and outlook for the energy transition in the US and Canada. Uh, whereas in Europe, we looked at geopolitics and energy security and the role that those uh, elements have to play in the future of uh, energy supply chains around Europe. So all in all, you know, what we do in these energy transition events, as I said, is we bring together all of those really senior stakeholders who are looking to, you know, change momentum or are looking to really affect change within their industries in, in the energy transition itself. We bring them together. We have them share strategy with each other, learn from each other build a community, build their place in that community. And ultimately, year on year, we want this to be a staple in those executive diaries and be you know, touching base, checking in on each other, making sure that everybody's on the same page. And I think we've had a lot of real good success in this space in the last couple of years. And it has really reminded us how, especially on the back of COVID and the pandemic and the lockdowns and you know, being the events business, of course, suffered a real existential threat all the way throughout COVID. And, and now... On the back of that, people have really, I think, cottoned on to how important those face-to-face -face meetings and how valuable those in-person conversations can be. Okay. And as someone who sits there kind of at the intersection of, of all these senior stakeholders coming together, I bet you have a unique perspective on, on what they're all talking about and what the future might hold. So one of the things I like to do on the show is ask all my guests for bold predictions about any given area of the renewable energy transition that they're involved with. So I'm going to ask you the same question. When you look at the energy transition for the next few years, any things that are maybe not on people's radar or any kind of bold predictions you want to you want to go out and make? Yeah, so I think there's so much dynamism, so much momentum in the energy transition market space that you could make a whole host of bold predictions and you'd probably be right in lots of ways or in some ways on almost all of them because of how quickly it is evolving and, and the momentum we have in this space. But I think there are two bold predictions that I would make in terms of what we would see in the energy industry in the next kind of decades to come. First one is hydrogen. Um, I think hydrogen is is really something that is going to come. It's a bit of a dark horse at this stage, and it's it's not necessarily super well understood, least of all by me, kind of how that will play into existing energy supply chains. And we talked about it earlier with infrastructure, etc. But I think the potential for hydrogen to unlock so much from specific technologies to you know fuels, you know, often touted as a fuel of the future, aviation fuel, shipping fuel, right the way through to industrial processes, you know, in combination with carbon capture, etc. There is so much potential for hydrogen to unlock. You know, is it a replacement for fossil fuels? How does it work in terms of you know electrification of the grid, etc.? So I think hydrogen is something that is yet to be understood kind of exactly how momentous it's going to be uh, in terms of the upheaval for the market. But I'm personally really excited to see how that develops further. And then I would say, secondly, I think it's it's the emergence of collaborative and circular partnerships and, and new kind of relationships between you know, essentially old foes in legacy energy environments. And so, you know, again, thinking about hydrogen, for example, it offers the opportunity for new 
off takers to come into the value chain in places they never have done before. You know, as I said, again, in combination with carbon capture and carbon capture being fed back into energy systems for production purposes, I think we're going to see a real change in the way that these relationships form between key energy stakeholders. So, you know, we're already seeing big organizations partner up on offshore wind farms. We're seeing them partner up uh, on carbon capture and storage projects, on larger energy storage projects as well, because, you know, not every company has the the right capabilities to be able to do what's necessary in the energy transition today. You know, the oil and gas companies, for example, are, are set up to cater to the oil and gas market environment. And they have very robust capabilities in some spaces. But of course, then there are renewable power generators or renewable manufacturers, renewable technology developers who have capacity and capabilities in places those oil and gas companies don't. And so, you know, rather than the adversarial competitivity that we've seen in the market in in sort of the last 20, 30 years, what I think we're now seeing is more of a conciliatory approach where folks are realizing that actually working together is not just better for their own bottom line and for the the revenue generation of their businesses, but it's also better for kind of the long-term prospects of their role to play in society, because that is how you decarbonize and that is how you cut carbon and, and cut emissions where they need to be um, is by maximizing that efficiency and leaning on the capabilities of those partner organizations that, that you may not necessarily have. So I think in a nutshell, we're looking at hydrogen really changing the game in years to come. And I think we're looking at the nature of relationships between these different stakeholders changing rapidly as well. Well, I got to tell you, I'm a big fan of uh, any prediction that involves foes becoming friends and <laughs> collaborating. <laughs> so uh, listen, Luke, I appreciate all the insights you've shared. It's a fascinating conversation, and I'm looking forward to being at the event in New York City in June. It sounds like it's going to be a, a lot of smart thinkers pointing the way for where the energy transition is headed next. So thank you for your time today and for sharing all your insights. Thanks, Sean, very much. Appreciate speaking to you. And yeah, looking forward to seeing you and the team at the event as well later in the year. If you like this podcast, please share it with your friends and colleagues and be sure to follow us on Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also follow us on Twitter where our handle is at renewables pod. And if you'd like a daily dose of renewable news delivered to your inbox, head to smartbrief.com and sign up for the renewable energy smart brief. The renewable energy smart pod is a production of smart brief, a future company. Smart brief.